It's Friday, 3rd of November, 23, and yesterday the Beatles released their last single, Now and Then. Uh, well, it was a John Lennon song, really. I wrote it around about 1977, and they had a demo of it, just tape he made in his house in uh, New York in 77 or something like that. And uh, Yoko found it or whatever. And they were going to do it for the anthology thing in 95, which I remember. And I liked those two songs that they'd done at the time, Freezer Bird and uh, Real Love. It's Real Love. Uh, but this one, yeah, it's really good, you know. I really, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I've heard the demo before, you know, so I knew what to expect in that. And yeah, it didn't disappoint really. The, the more I listened to it, the more I like it really. I see that last bit, just do 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 I don't know, that makes me really sad. Oh, it did earlier on, not so much now. But just, I suppose it feels like the end really, you know. Uh, but yeah, what a remarkable band. They are sort of, they're like the Shakespeare of uh, popular music, you know, because <clears throat> first we had Elvis in, some, in 54 and that. And then, of course, over here, the kids liked it, including including the Beatles. But then around about 56 or whatever, over in Britain, the kids liked uh, Lonnie Donegan and his, his skiffle music. And I can understand why, you know, because I liked, I liked Lonnie Donegan when I was uh, younger. Uh, does your tune gum lose its flavour on the bedpost overnight, you know? That's a, cause it, it had a sort of punkiness about it, you know? And then in those days they were making their own bass, bass things, they weren't even bass guitars, they were, you know, like the old bass things. They were making them out of boxes and bits of string and... And even Jimmy Page has said about that, you know, about Skiffle, that's where, you know, he got his excitement from or whatever. But then, <coughs> what I regard as a... Uh, the basis of popular music is the Beatles, really, so that was around 62, you know. Um, yeah, and it's just amazing. It's incredible that 60 years later we're still... I mean, it's now... It's 61 years since their first single in Britain. In fact, it was November 62, Love Me Do. Um, and they've made that the, the B-side of this, or a double A-side of this song. And I think they've done a new mix of it, probably in stereo. Because uh, back in that time, they only had two track things. And they only get a few minutes in the studio and stuff, you know. Their first album, I think, they done in 24 hours or something like that. Um, yeah, but really, they, they are the basis of what I think of as pop music and rock music, you know. And, uh, I mean, there has been some different formats since them, you know, like... Because at the same time, you had Motown that had the, that sort of music in it. Uh, because, but since then, you know, right about the 90s, I would say the genres seem to sort of fizzle out, you know. But rap was the next, the last big one that I can really think of. And electronic dance music, I suppose, or, you know, house music, grave, or... Um, but uh, the Beatles, for me, on that wing, of music, which is where I am, really, you know. Uh, yeah, they're like Shakespeare, really, you know, we'll be talking about them in uh, centuries to come, probably. I mean, I just can't believe how enjoyable their music was. And I was a, a Beatle reject or whatever, because I was into punk, like the Sex Pistols and... Uh, well, mainly the Sex Pistols, really, but uh, the Jam. Um, the Smiths, but that was later on. Uh, yeah. So, uh, and really, uh, I looked down at the Beatles and I, I, I'd never heard most of the stuff of their albums. I still haven't heard a lot of their albums. I've went through them quickly, just skim thing made. Um, I've only heard Abbey Road about twice, which is, so it's a fantastic album, really, you know, especially that medley around the end. And what I really like about the medley is there was just so much attention to detail in the Beatles, you know, and, and uh, also the, the values they had because I knew all, I know all their singles, I've always known all their singles. 
But apparently in their first f- five albums or something, they didn't put any of the singles on the on the albums. And that's because when they were kids and they bought albums, they felt let down if the singles were on the album because they just wanted all new stuff, you know. And that's just so honourable. And that's what I would w- hope to do as well, you know. I mean, it's it's a marketing mistake, but obviously it didn't affect the Beatles too much, you know, but... Um, yeah, just that sort of thing. And then the other thing, like, if all of them didn't want a song, uh, if, they, if all of them didn't sing me it, they, then they didn't do it as the Beatles. And there was a few, I mean, uh, a number one in America was uh, Peter Asher, um, who was Jane, who's Jane Asher's brother, who Paul was engaged to during the 60s. She, he had a hit with... World, leave me alone. World Without Love, which isn't a really a good song, actually, but uh, I can see why the other Beatles rejected it, really, but, I mean, it is a catchy song, and it was number one in the USA for Peter Asher, um, but just that sort of thing. I mean, you would think it's maybe Paul that was getting all the rejected stuff, but actually, I mean, they didn't do Cold Turkey by John Lennon. Apparently, Paul and George didn't think that was... Um, I think that was a number one here, was it? I don't know, about uh, 69 or something. But I, I maybe that was uh, John, sort of. I, I, he was going to leave the band anyway, but... Uh, yeah, it's just amazing, but this uh, new song... Uh, I, do, I liked it as soon as I heard the demo, you know. Uh, I remember Freezer Bird and that, which I liked as well, but I just thought the voice didn't... The technology at the time, they couldn't get the voice out, you know. I mean, they were almost doing it analog back then, even though they were doing it with computer. And I'm not a fan of Jeff Lynne's productions. You know, he's he's really <coughs> over the top. He does double double tracking of your instrument and stuff. You know, what what I've seen when he does the yellow. No, I mean, I like some yellow stuff, but I'm not really as a as an identity. You know, you know, like Telephone Line or Mr. Blue Sky and that. I don't know. I mean, that guy from Buggles always gives Jeff a hard time about his lyrics. I don't know, because I've never really listened to his lyrics, but, uh, yeah, the lyrics on this John Lennon song, or the Beatles song, it sound, they're touching as well, and it's sort of, there seems there's lots of layers to the song, because uh, they've taken some of the back, backy, some of the backing vocals from some of their old songs, like Eleanor Rigby, and, uh, but I, I can't hear any of them so far. I've only listened to it about four times. I listened to it yesterday, it came out at two o'clock, uh, but it's, and I'm a big fan of Ringo's drums, you know, maybe not so much on this one so far, but I think it'll probably grow on me, you know, I used to look down on Ringo's drumming, just because of what people were saying in a way, but probably, yeah, I I was prejudiced, but now I understand, I really like his drummings and his fills and just the sensitivity and bringing in the symbols and hi hat and that. He's really got a feel for it, you know, because he didn't do any practice. He just, he just done what he felt. And of course, when they were over in Hamburg and that, they were playing every night, you know. Uh, although I don't think Ringo played. He only stood in for them sometimes because he was actually with another band who were the big band of uh, Liverpool at the time, um, who were also over in Hamburg. Another thing about Hamburg is, I think it's amazing is that they were all over there in 1960 or 1959 or whatever. And that was only like 14 years after the war, you know. It's just amazing that after that war, countries like Germany and Japan were their friends and their allies and still are, you know. That's amazing. Um, but yeah, and it is funny that the Beatles, when they were over there, there was, uh, and before that, they were actually a five group, and there were three guitarists, Paul, George, and uh, John, and another bass, a bass guitarist, Stuart, I can't remember his full name now. Uh, apparently he was, he was terrible at the bass, or whatever. <coughs> so that's funny that they were really three guitarists, and, that, and that's how it sounds like when I listen to Paul, you know, he sounds like a lead guitarist. He's, he's probably the most melodic, enjoyable gu- bass guitarist I can think of, you know, when you hear his his basses, like, uh, 
come together or anything. You know, I think he annoyed the others because he always thought he was too overbearing and all that. And then on his pace, he was. But even Paul said that, you know, he said, well, okay, maybe I was a bit too busy on the base. But it's so melodic, it's enjoyable. And Ringo said about 10 years ago in an interview they both done for America, you know, he's the most melodic bassist I've ever heard. The most m- melodic bassist I know of. Uh, it's funny, like, because uh, uh, apparently, because Paul's always got this bossiness sort of thing, me. But Ringo said that when it came to Sergeant Pepper, if it wasn't for uh, Paul, we wouldn't have done anything again, probably, because the, th- the other three, you know, just weren't doing anything by then. And uh, so it was really Paul that was getting that. And that was our greatest work afterwards, you know, Sergeant Pepper, The White Arrow, and Let It Be, and Abbey Road. You know, especially, probably Abbey Road, probably more than... Uh, Yes, so, um, uh, what was I talking about again? But anyway, the Ringo said that, you know, at first he said he didn't want to do the song because they had the song left over from 95 because they couldn't separate uh, all the other noises from the t- cassette tape. It was, uh, there was uh, the John's piano and and on the song as well, John was just you know singing quietly. He wasn't singing full, full throttle, you know. But they've managed to get that clarity out now with the with their machinery, uh, digital stuff, you know. I mean, they're calling it artificial artificial intelligence, but I don't think it is really because you're really just taking away the other sounds. There was a buzzing sound apparently. Somebody says it was probably like a, an RCA jack plugged in somewhere, something like that. Uh, but, uh, yeah, and, uh, well, that's just ruined my treat. Yeah, but anyway, Ringo didn't want to do it, or so he said it first anyway, but uh, <clears throat> when I heard it, you know, I really liked it, the demo or whatever. Uh, and that's another thing, they've, they've taken out a section and the section, you know, there was three bits to the song. Uh, and there was a bit, uh, I don't want to lose you. But I think he said something like, I don't want to abuse you or something. So maybe they didn't, they felt a bit thing maybe that. But also, it was in a different key. I mean, John liked these sort of things in there. It is nice. And even though it, it went to A rather than A minor, I think most of it's an A minor. <clears throat> but it was still nice. You know, I liked it. I would have probably tried to put it in at least once. Uh, I think it was in twice in the demo. And maybe they were just filler words as well, you know. But uh, It was probably Paul that's overseen the arrangement of this one, probably. Uh, but I have nothing wrong with that, you know. Uh, if somebody's a boss, somebody's got to do it, you know. It's up to other people to hang there. I mean, Ring, I, I'd imagine Ringo's fine with it anyway. I mean... <clears throat> I think at the time, back in the 60s, Ringo get fed up with Paul as well, you know, but, uh, but you know, like he says, Ringo appreciates him now on, when he looks back, you know, because he, he says, like, after Rubber Soul, Soul probably wouldn't have got anything done, I think. I think they regard Rubber Soul as the last one where they really worked as a band, because after that, a lot of time they were working individually or, you know, but anyway, uh I mean, they did try to do it again with Let It Be. But anyway, he got the demo over from Paul. And Paul had put drums on it, you know. And Ringo was laughing about that because it's typical Paul. Because Paul played the drums in some of the Beatles songs as well. He played on oh, the ballad of John and Yoko because uh, it was just... It was just John and Paul that were in Britain at the time, I think. The other two were in holiday. <clears throat> and that was the last, the Beatles' last number one. And, uh, and funny enough, I think, John insulted Paul the day before and he walked out or whatever, but he came back in for the, that the next day. I don't know if that's wrong, but it's probably true, you know. I think John's a pretty obnoxious guy, you know. Yeah, or they could be, yeah. And so uh, Ringo got the thing and it had Paul's drum tracks on it. Some say that Paul's a better drummer than me because I think he'd done all the drums for uh, Band on the Run because... Wings were going to Nigeria to do, make that, uh, EMI Nigeria. <coughs> but in, 
Round about the day before, the rest of the band said we don't want to go, apart from Denny Lane. So it was Denny Lane, Wyndham McCartley and Paul that played on Band on the Run, really. Which, it's a fantastic song, that Band on the Run, you know, it's uh, one of my... It really is a, a classic. I mean, I prefer John Lennon and stuff, but Paul could really do a, a great song as well. <coughs> and he was such an interesting bassist. I like to say, though, that the three of them were really lead guitarists, you know, because uh, Paul done the, the lead for Taxman by uh, George Harrison, uh, who wrote it. Uh, but George, at the time, <coughs> he was struggling to get a, a sort of lead and for some reason he left the studio, maybe <clears throat> maybe they said something like, maybe George Martin said something like, give Paul a try or something, I hope not, but maybe. And then Paul came up with a really good thing, me. I don't know how George felt about it, you know, but... Uh, <clears throat> and to me, I think Attax Man is the first, is the template for sort of my, my branch of popular music. That's like sort of the first song I can think of that sort of I think of as the energy for punk and for probably heavy metal as well. Rock. I mean, Paul reckons that uh, uh, what was it? Uh, Helter Skelter sort of could be the sort of template for heavy metal. <clears throat> I don't know myself, you know, because I think heavy metals sort of people suggest it's uh, Aussie. Aussie's band, what's that called again? Uh, Black Sabbath, I don't know, Black Sabbath, but anyway, yeah. But uh, going on to the song again, yeah, it's really nice, it's, and it's layered, as I said, like the Beatles always do layers. I mean, it comes in one, two, I think I heard them say three, somebody said that <coughs> they didn't hear three, four, and they thought it was applying that, uh, <coughs> implying that, you know, there's only two of them left, you know. And it is sad to think that uh, we could have had all those years of John's music as well, you know, because I, I think he would have got back on track, because I, I think he totally lost track, you know. I mean, some of his stuff from the 70s that I remember wasn't very good. Uh, <clears throat> he said himself that he, he started going for the feeling of the song. <clears throat> he called these songs like uh, Help and the ones he'd done in the early days of the Beatles, as craftsmanship, and he said he could do that, but he didn't He didn't get enjoyment from it. He, you know, he preferred just doing it from the heart, which was good as well, but then he, he went away off tangent at the other end because he'd done Revolution Number no. 9, which is a disgrace, really, you know. Uh, and then a lot of stuff that he'd done in the 70s uh, was pretty dire, really. I mean... Uh, <coughs> But I think he would have got his mojo back, really. He seemed to be getting there with Double Fantasy and Milk and Honey. You know, Milk and Honey was just sort of tracks that he'd laid down. And uh, I think he didn't like playing live music, and neither did George. Uh, John got really anxious. I don't know if he was sick every time, and apparently Johnny Rotten's the same. He gets sick before every, every uh, <clears throat> performance. You know, oh, that's, I don't know, I think John was maybe the same, I don't know. He, he, so so he, they didn't really like playing live with George or thing, because George was going to do a tour in 92, uh, and he done, started off in Japan with Eric Clapton, but he didn't he didn't go through with it, I don't know why. Uh, but <clears throat> and the other thing, uh, so it starts with our one, two, three, four, and it's also sad to think that... Uh, the two of them were almost murdered, you know. We nearly lost two, two Beatles to murder. You know, we lost John and uh, George. If that guy had, if Olivia, his wife, hadn't hit him over the head with a vase or whatever, that guy would have murdered him that night when he broke into his house in, in uh, <coughs> sorry or whatever I was saying. You know, uh, so he was saved, although he died two years later from lung cancer or throat cancer or whatever. <coughs> uh, so, yeah, it's really sad, that, you know. Uh, so we would have lost George, but... Uh, and that guy that done that was sanctioned in a mental health thing, mate, and he got out two years later or something. 
So the song's really nice. <clears throat> I do wonder if John would have wanted the Beatles to do it all the same, but he might have done, because I think, <clears throat> I think they would have came together again. Uh, just because of uh, the love that people have for them, you know? Because as I've, I've been listening to, you know, I didn't realise that there would be Beatles podcasts on the YouTube and that, you know, people talking, you know, as if, as if they're still around. <laughs> well, they are, because two of them, I mean, both Paul and Ringo are, I think they're even touring at the moment. <clears throat> Not together. Uh, but ironically, Paul's voice is totally gone. His singing voice, you know, but... Um, although Glastonbury was still a great... A great thing to see, a great performance. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Paul's voice is totally gone, even just for talking. You know, it's shattered. Whereas, funnily enough, Ringo sounds like he's got the power of Pavarotti. You know, I think Ringo's about 83 and Paul's about 81 or something. <clears throat> yeah, and I've just been listening to these podcasts. And I, I mean, if you want to look at YouTube, I suppose Ken Michaels is the guy to look at. Once you find him, you'll find all the rest of them, you know. Uh, but it's just, that is just amazing. Because <clears throat> it, it may be funny to some people who think there's Beatles news, you know. But, uh I suppose two of them are still alive, so there is Beatles news. Um, and it also feels to me like the Beatles are getting bigger, but that might just because I've been searching it on YouTube and uh, it's it's all reactions today that are coming up on my, my homepage on YouTube, you know. Uh, <clears throat> but it does feel like they're getting bigger, you know. Uh, mainly because of streaming and that, you can listen to anything now, you know. Back in those days, you had to actually buy the thing, you know. Now you can just, somebody mentions a song or something, you can just listen to it and then come back, listen to them or whatever, talking about it or whatever. <clears throat> yeah, but the song, yeah, it's really good. Uh, this time they used uh, Giles Martin as the producer and that's the son of George Martin. He's been sort of in that sort of field with the Beatles for a while. <clears throat> it's a nice job, but uh, <coughs> I still feel it's a bit, Overproduced. Maybe I'll get used to that, you know, because this is just a first reaction. I think I've listened to it about five times or something. Um, but it's really nice. As I say, they've taken a section out. I would have maybe tried to put it in somewhere. And I think it, <coughs> it would have, might have been nice at the end. Like in Abbey Road when they'd done the medley. I mean, there were really three lead guitarists. John, George and John and... It would have been nice if um, maybe they could have finished it with, in the medley, the three of them done uh, get a guitar challenge thing, or not a challenge, but the, the, they all get two bars each, two rounds of two bars each, or was it three rounds uh, on that last, and in the end, that song. Uh, which I didn't know until recently, and I just, again, that just, it's another thing that, that was just so touching that they all, they all got to do lead guitar, you know, because they all were really lead guitarists. I mean, John said to George, he prefers his own lead guitar, you know. I would need to hear more of John's lead guitar, because I, I I'm not sure that I, I prefer John's, but I, I liked George's lead, but I think Paul would be a good lead as well. Um, <clears throat> Because even when Paul was in Wings, I think he let others be the lead, you know. <clears throat> so maybe it would have been nice if they sort of, I think, John said, I'll finish off that that uh, medley, that guitar challenge thing, and then with a beep, 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 something like that. Maybe it would have been good if they could have put that in. But then the way the song finishes, eh, uh, made me sad anyway because it did it went do 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 that made me sort of sad anyway so it, it did work and it, it was really nice like I say I would have tried to put in that other <clears throat> verse in somewhere maybe even change the words and the other thing is that Paul's doing backing vocals but I can hardly hear him which is probably just as well you know because um, his voice is totally gone there was some talk that maybe they were going <clears> to <throat> try and use his Paul's young voice for it 
But then I would think that that would be artificial intelligence, you know. But I'm glad they didn't because uh, it's young John's Will. He was, what, 38 at the time. Young John's voice and old Paul's voice. And the song's called Now and Then. You know, Paul's 81 or whatever. <clears throat> I think John would have been 82. And I was just watching... Uh, John's birthday was about two weeks ago or three weeks ago. And uh, I see over in uh, New York in Central Park, they've got the strawberry fields and memory of John. And every year, a lot of guitarists and stuff go there and have a big celebration of the Beatles. And you can see it on video. It's, it's really uplifting, you know. <clears throat> it seems to be a lot of the same people every year in that, but it's, it's really uplifting. And I'm glad it's the same people. Yeah, but it's a really top quality song. It'll be interesting. Uh, well, I'm not interested in the charts anyway. I couldn't tell you anything about the charts now or or even radio stations. I, I don't even listen to radio stations or, you know, it's a mystery to me when I'm reading about the rage R figures and people are talking about Zoball's figures have dropped. I mean, I just can't believe anybody's listening to radio, especially because of adverts or just a name talking, you know, that sort of stuff. But... Uh, <clears throat> But yeah, the Beatles have really, uh, <coughs> they've really, <coughs> sorry about my thing, I've got a bit of a cold and that, yeah. but I've only been listening to the Beatles for five years or something, mostly other people talking about them, I mean there's still probably songs that I haven't heard probably, but because uh, <coughs> on their first four albums or something they've done a lot of uh, covers, that's what you've done back in those days really, yeah, a lot of covers and, but even <coughs> the first that I heard of some of their great songs that weren't singles was in Stars in 45 in 1981. That was Star Sound or something. And uh, <coughs> that was the first time I heard stuff like Baby You Can Drive My Car or uh, Nowhere Man. I'd never heard these songs before. And that song Rain, I'd never heard that until about five years ago or something. And it just, this is outstanding I know that apparently you two sing it when they're doing outdoor concerts and it starts raining but uh, <clears throat> yeah it was the double A side with the paperback writer or, or it was the B side <clears throat> that's another thing their B sides are fantastic as well you know I wonder if they were people who invented double A sides you know because the, the singles they were putting out were so good that you really had to make them double A sides you know yeah uh, I'm guessing that's all in the past now. You don't have double A sides anymore, right, do you? Yeah, and I wonder if most people will end up, you know, as Beatle, Beatle maniacs at some point, you know. Uh, like I say, it's like Shakespeare, except you can understand it, you know. It's just amazing. And also, I think, uh, at the time, I think the 1960s is probably the most profound change for the better. And, uh, well, certainly over the last 100 years. I don't know before that, you know. I mean, things like getting electricity and stuff, but culturally, uh, liberation, you know, uh, female liberation or whatever, yeah. Because they invented the pill that, in that decade as well, I think. Uh, <coughs> but just down in, because when you look at it, the Beatles started in black and white with very, very big, cameras that were heavy, big, heavy, immovable cameras. <clears throat> the footage of them at that time was pretty poor. Then about five years later, they were in colour, doing All You Need Is Love for that, uh, live for that. <clears throat> On satellite, I think it was the first satellite broadcast that was in colour, and then they done the Hey Jude and all that. You know, literally that decade went from black and white to colour. And also music, who became totally liberated. Everything did, because you, when you think before that, I don't think teenagers hardly existed, the whole idea, concept of teenagers. Uh, I suppose it came about in, when Elvis arrived, you know, and that was the first, <clears throat> you know, because I would imagine it was teenagers were the biggest fans of Elvis. Um, yeah, that was, you didn't really have a culture of, teenager then, it was probably just young adults or whatever, you know. Uh, yeah, this, the 60s was expression, you know, uh, just everything, liberation. Um, 
I suppose that's where we went from soci socially conservative to uh, totally liberated, you know, we had uh, all the fashion stuff. Uh, it was just an incredible time. It's like, then it sort of uh, <coughs> still carried on a bit to the 70s, uh, even the 80s to a bit, then it sort of fizzled out, or maybe it was just became used to it. Mostly I'm talking about music when I talk about this. For me, music sort of finished around about 84, something like that. I think that was the last year I can think of where there was. And funny enough, that professor of rock on YouTube, he agrees with me. <laughs> or I agree with him. Yeah, that was the last year where you had... And I think that's <clears throat> apparently the, the peak year of sales. It kept going up and up every year till 79. And then it started going down. <clears throat> Uh, to me, 84, 85, house music came in, which I am not a fan of. And uh, I suppose if you go to a club now, that's the sort of thing you get, isn't it? It's sort of the, the offspring of house music, you know, electronic dance music. I mean, to me, they're literally dancing to the same song all night, you know, the same beat or whatever. Or it's almost like a sort of tribal thing, which I'm not against, you know, and that's... that's I can understand that, looking at it from that point of view. <clears throat> you know, but, but they're, they're not really into sort of three minute, four minute songs and you go to another one, that sort of thing. You know, if people go to that, that Scottish DJ with Calvin, um, what's that? You know, if they go to his rave thing at, in Ibiza or whatever, they're all just standing about, which, which I, I think is quite a nice thing as well, like, <clears throat> you know, you don't ask, you don't have to dance with somebody, you can just stand there. <laughs> it's better having sitting round tables, I suppose. <clears throat> but anyway, back to the Beatles again, I think. All roads leads to the Beatles. It is amazing, they, they, they innovated everything, they always seem to be ahead in every way. <clears throat> I mean, I'm surprised at how I think of things and then I think, oh, it was probably the Beatles that done that first or whatever, you know, even stuff like Paperback Writer, when they were, the way they were using the amp for the bass, to pump up the bass volume. I think it was Jeff, what's his name? Jeff Emerick. They got in there and they, he put the mic next to the bass amp or something. And I think Paul was using a Rickenbacker then, because he, he uses his honer mostly, and he, he was using his honer for the new track. <coughs> and, uh, oh yeah, Paul's bass on uh, the song now and then is... It's really great. I thought, <coughs> one thing, in the first bit that he done, in the second bar, <coughs> he got a bit fancy and I thought, no, you should have just stayed in the route, just for once. Just stay on the route. You know, because he used to stay in the route all the time, or <coughs> mostly in the first four albums, because that's what you done back in those days. I think it was the stuff like the Motown guy that influenced him to <coughs> become melodic. But the rest of Paul's stuff is really melodic. He, he, he does stuff that most people would just stay in the root chord. Just bum, 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 bum. But he's going boom, 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 things like that. You know, he's... I don't know what he's doing, actually, but... Uh, <clears throat> whether he's bent... No, he's not bending it, probably. Is, probably... It's just so interesting. Uh, it's just amazing that somebody's making a root bass chord so interesting, you know. Um, so, I. Uh, Apart from that first thing me that pulled on, I may change my mind about that, but but uh, the rest of it I really enjoyed the, the, the sounds he was making with it. They were really subtle as well. I saw a bit of the video, uh, <clears throat> but they came out beefy now because in the old days the honer didn't have the honer's not get much <clears throat> much oomph of its own, but now they can probably bring it out, you know. Um, yeah. And I couldn't really hear George, you know. I know George done acoustic stuff in uh, 95. I couldn't really hear it. Uh, I know that uh, Paul done the, uh, the lead, and he done the steel guitar. <coughs> uh, and in reference to George, and, uh, <coughs> it's pretty basic. He probably wanted to keep it that way, because George... Used to do that stuff with uh, steel guitar. Uh, is it steel guitar? In there? I'm not saying that right, am I? It's, it's where you use that thing <coughs> on the fretboard, on your finger. Uh, George was a big fan of that. 
But somebody was saying, like, David Gilmore can just do a lot with one note, and George could do that with the steel guitar. Why not? Whereas, no, Paul's probably just as good. Maybe Paul's trying to keep it. He knew that George probably wouldn't want to do anything fancy. Although I liked George's leads and the Beatles, from what I remember anyway. I would need to, maybe I'm mixing them up or something. But, uh, yeah. Uh, John just singing on a song and it, his voice is really clear and that, you know, like Free as a Bird and the 95 stuff, I thought his voice was poor quality, you know, it, because it, it sounded as if he was in another room or something or in a bathroom or something, you know, but this time he, he really came out clear, you know, because really they've got a digital, digital thing. You know, I suppose one thing was that... Uh, Probably when he was singing it, he was just singing it quietly, you know, in his house. He wasn't, he wasn't giving it oomph, although it's not an oomph song. <clears throat> so maybe that's even nicer, you know, it's sort of uh, subtle, you know. Yeah, it's really a good song and I, I think I'm going to like it more and more as I listen to it, you know. I still think of Free as a Bird and uh, Real Love or whatever that other song was called. <clears throat> You know, they were, they were sort of nice songs. I still think of Band on the Run, The, the Wings. Um, yeah, it's just amazing what an effect. And it's amazing that they're still having an effect on us now, live. You know what I mean? <clears throat> Some people say there's other songs that they've still unfinished. There's another one, apparently, that's made, that some of the Beatles fans like better. And Paul McCartney's over in Australia and just now doing his uh, doing a tour of Australia. Yeah. yeah. So that's it. Uh, it's just we're so lucky. It is weird because you'd think music could move on, but maybe there's nowhere to move on to, you know what I mean? Uh, it's just really uh, uh, four bars or whatever the whatever they call it. Alright guys. I hope that's been enjoyable. Goodbye.